All right, so let's talk about skin. So we're talking about the skin. We're generally talking about three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. And this is a good diagram, more or less, to get to know. It identifies the epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis. We'll talk about them a little bit more in detail. The hypodermis is mostly fat and vasculature. It also has some lymph vessels in it as well. Um, and then epidermis and dermis we'll talk about as we go through the certain cells that live within each. So just a comparison between the two, uh, humans and dogs and cats. So dogs and cats, uh, dogs in particular, have three to five layers of live cells in their skin. pH is seven and a half. They have cyclical growth of skin and cyclical shedding. They have hair bundles as uh, through the follicles. Each follicle has numerous hairs. And they have 22 day skin turnover, skin and hair. Humans have 10 to 15 layers of live cells, pH of five and a half. They have continual hair growth and it's one hair per follicle and 28 day turnover. <clears throat> Looking at the epith or sorry, epidermis here, yeah, sorry, I'm just getting my place. So looking at epithelial cells, as we get into cytology, we're going to look at various forms of epithelial cells and in various areas of the body. So they start to change. They have general properties that are more or less the same wherever they are, but their overall physical properties can change slightly depending where they are in the body. So we'll definitely be looking at vaginal cytology, <clears throat> skin cytology, so just regular epithelial cells of the skin, ones of, it's redundant, but epithelial cells of the outer skin, right, the, the most superficial skin, like tumors that we tend to look at, etc. So when we're looking at <clears throat> the layers in the epithelium, we have a few different layers, oops, as it carries on it goes up, so it starts off with the, the basal layer, so the basal cells are at the very base, so the basement membrane, the very base of the stack of live cells. And basal cells are beautiful baby cells. They have ripe, juicy, round nuclei. They're fairly uniform in shape and size, and their cytoplasm is fairly small and concise. So that's the basal cells right there. And we will at some point look at some basal cells in class. Really common for them to clump together and to be in sheets when you're looking at them on your slide. And then you get into these uh, keratinocytes. Well, basal cells are technically also keratinocytes. So we have basal cells, and then we call these intermediate cells. Okay, so they're not quite babies. They're not quite old dying cells. They're just in the middle. So they're just adult cells. And they start to vary a little bit in shape and size, um, nucleus size, cytoplasm to nucleus ratio. So we've got, we generally call them keratinocytes. And as we carry on, we will call all the cells from here on out keratinocytes. So when we move up further, more superficially, so this is deep where the basal cells are, this is more superficial, we start getting into sort of keratocytes that have seen better days. So they start to lose their bouncy intermediate shape, so their nice hexagonal or round shape. Their nuclei start to change shape. They start to become a little bit more pycnotic, so a little bit more small. And then as they continue to get pushed up superficially, they start to die. So at the very top are dead keratinocytes, and they have no nucleus, they've lost their nucleus, um, or they may have a very tiny, tiny pycnotic nucleus, but typically by the time they're dead, their nucleus is completely gone, and they're sloughing off. So that is if you scratch your skin a little bit hard in the winter, and you see all that flaky, wonderful white stuff falling off, those are dead keratinocytes. So a lot of times when we're taking skin cell samples, we're getting a lot of dead keratinocytes because they're the most readily available. They've lost a lot of their adhesion to other cells, and they tend to just flake off. Now, just keep in mind again, basal cells are starting, uh, so keratinocytes essentially are starting at the very basement layer, okay, very deep layer of the epidermis, and working their way up. And as they work their way up, they're changing shape and size, and slowly their nucleus is dying. Um, as they start getting up to the, the more superficial keratinocytes, lipids are injected onto the keratinocytes, even in the intermediate stage, so after they lose their basal shape and size, 
basal cell shape and size. They start getting up into intermediate keratinocytes. Lipids are covering them to help waterproof so that as they reach the most superficial area of the skin, they're waterproofing and protecting that skin, so they form a barrier. So if you think about it, basal cells are baby cells. Okay, They're fresh, they're round, they have beautiful, big, juicy nuclei. And keratinocytes, especially um, keratinocytes as they age and become intermediate keratinocytes, become sort of the older folks, okay, intermediate and beyond. And then lastly, this amazing guy, <laughs> we have dread, dead keratinocytes, which are still covered in a lipid um, coating, so they still provide a pro protective barrier for the skin, but they've lost their adhesion to other cells, so they readily exfoliate. That's the term to use. They readily exfoliate, meaning that they leave the body and they leave their other cells extremely quickly. All right, so epidermis, we're looking at that one layer of uh, skin, the epidermis. So we've got keratinocytes, they produce keratin, the tough, fibrous, waterproof protein that gives skin its resiliency and strength. Okay, uh, melanocytes produce melanin pigment, pigment, which protects from UV. Merkel cells, I love the name Merkel cells because it reminds me of Urkel. They phagocytize microinvaders, the Merkel cells. So they are a macrophage, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that are very specific to the epidermis, okay? A specific type of macrophage that only lives within the skin. And then we have Langerhans cells, which are found in the stratum spinosum and may be involved in allergic and cell-mediated uh, immune response in the skin. And I think I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So breakdown of epi epidermis cytology, just typical cells that you see in their ratios. Um, Oftentimes we don't see all of these cells in cytology, such as Langerhans cells. We tend not to see, same with Merkel cells, we don't necessarily see it in cytology. In histopathology, when they're taking a segment of the tissue itself and cutting it, dividing it, looking at it, that's when you're really going to see the true variation in cells. For us, most of the time when we're looking at skin, we're going to be seeing keratinocytes, so squamous type cells, intermediate cells, basal cells melanocytes, and then some um, some macrophages kicking around just depending on, on what we're looking at specifically. So 85% keratinocytes, 5% melanocytes, 8% Langerhans cells, 2% miscellaneous including white blood cells and Merkel cells, and then you get cholesterol crystals and fat, and I'll talk about those as well. So like we said, I said, keratinocytes are a moisture barrier as they work their way from the basal cell layer, so keratinocytes are basal cells, basal cell is the baby form, and then in the middle they become intermediate, and then we typically just call them keratinocytes and dead keratinocytes as they reach the superficial surface. But when they're at the basal cell layer, as they're leaving that basal layer, uh, lipid coats them, and they use that along with the, um, oh, I can't remember. Right. Um, nope, forgotten. It's out of my head. <laughs> but they use that. Let me go back. My goodness. Keratin. Sorry. <laughs> so they use that lipid and keratin to protect and to create that barrier from the outside world into the skin. They also have uh, antimicrobial defense. There's some phagocytosis that occurs. Uh, keratinocytes sometimes can phagocytize bacteria and foreign invaders. They have those immune messenger cells. Um, or sorry, they have slight immune messaging capabilities within them. And there are keratinocytes with melanin, and those are from melanocytes that have spread their uh, granules onto keratinocytes. Okay, so these are just common keratinocytes. These are intermediate cells here, so they still have a fairly round, decent-sized nucleus. And then you start getting into an older, more superficial cell. So superficial keratinocyte. It's got a really pycnotic nucleus, and it's just starting to die out. This is all protein and mucus in the background of this sample, in case you're wondering, and probably some bacteria, but I can't tell on this image. But these cloudy figures, really thin cytoplasm, look horn flaky, those are typical keratinocytes in the intermediate to superficial stage. Okay, likewise with these guys, intermediate to superficial, and also they have a whole bunch of white blood cells in the background. So squamous cells, what we typically see in urine, are 
more toward the superficial stage of keratinocytes, where they have a pycnotic or nu no nucleus at all. This is a common finding when you're doing a skin sample, whether it be skin scraping, uh, skin swab, any sort of skin uh, sampling. So in this one in particular, you can see small little rod bacteria. And in these ones, you see these giant structures that are just hanging out on the keratinocytes. So these giant structures, in fact, are, and you can kind of see it here, they're really thin bars of rod bacteria. Okay, really thin bars of rod bacteria. You can see how those, those ones are breaking up. And it's called Simoncella species. It's a normal bacteria that's found on the skin. It's not, it's not harmful, it won't spread. And we see it when animals, no, uh, it's just hanging out on the skin. Sorry, what I was going to say is sometimes you see Simoncella bacteria on uh, vaginal swabs. Okay, we'll, we'll get into vaginal swabs. Sometimes you'll see it there or on oral mouth swabs. And that's because of grooming, because of grooming. You'll see this bacteria, but it normally resides on the skin and it's non-harmful. That stuff, I don't know what that is. It's a rod bacteria. Maybe that's harmful, but Simon Ciela, it's fine. Okay, melanocytes, uh, they carry melanin. So lots of little granules of melanin. So this in itself is a melanocyte. Now it's really hard to tell because the melanocyte itself, the whole cytoplasm is covered by melanin granules. And melanin granules are typically, I find that they look purple. However, sometimes they can look black or green, which is kind of strange to see a lot of green in a cell. So this is outlining the cytoplasm, and then they have a round, purple, juicy nucleus, as with everything that we'll ever talk about in this course. So the pigment, they can release the melanin into surrounding tissue and onto the surrounding keratinocytes, and the melanin in general absorbs UV. So this is a good example of purple melanocytes, so beautiful, nice, round nucleus. And then they have this sort of, um, well, they can change shape, and we'll talk about melanocytes a little bit more when we talk about, I think we talk about them with neoplasia, because they can change shapes depending on which tissue they originated from or which uh, tissue they're closely living with. So these ones are sort of wispy, non-descript. Um, <laughs> it's a silly term, but nondescript. Cytoplasm, just wispy, lack of shape, and then they have that round purple nucleus. And in their cytoplasms, it's all covered in those really dark purple fine granules. And some of them are more granulated than others, like that one, or like that one, more granul heavily granulated than others. And then we have a neutrophil and red blood cells kicking around. This is a melanocyte that's slightly more green, so just to see the variation in color. Okay, so Langerhans cells, uh, they're epidermal macrophages, so specific to the epidermis. They're dendritic, meaning that they have little fingers, so I always picture little jazz hands coming off of them. And that allows them to reach from cells to, uh, no, just from cells to other cells. And one of the jobs that they're finding the Langerhans cells responsible for is an immune response. So they're sort of the red flag warning system that then tells the, the T lymphocytes to create an immune reaction. So they're sort of the little red flag, they're the cell that holds the red flag to alert the body of an invader, of an immune compromise. Merkel cells, they have the best name ever because it reminds me of Steve Urkel from the 90s. So they're located at the epidermal and dermal junction, so right in that basement membrane. Uh, membrane. So right where the basal cells sit, you'll find Merkel cells that are attached to the intermediate um, keratinocytes and to the basal cells. And then they have this tactile disc and a sensory neuron. So these cells in themselves are actually connected to a neuron, which is really cool, or, and well, essentially to a nerve. So they are responsible to, for the sense of touch in animals. Um, they're indicated by slightly thickened areas in the skin. So humans, uh, not so much, but in dogs and cats, they're in bundles. And especially in areas of high hair growth, they're indicated in little bundled areas of the skin. So if you think about it, whiskers. Anywhere that uh, cats and dogs have whiskers, you'll see at the base of the whiskers a little bundle of skin.
And this is just a diagram identifying the the way that Merkel cells start off in the hypodermis, okay, on their neural pathway, and then through the dermis, the middle layer, and then they sit right at that basement membrane, right at the basal cell layer, um, with the cells actually attached to a neuron. Cholesterol crystals, so these you might find actually fairly commonly in uh, any type of epithelial sample, so epithelial cell scraping, um, swab, fine needle aspirate, etc. And it's the dissolution of keratin from the keratinocytes. Although it's common, uh, it doesn't mean anything bad, it just means that keratinocytes were once there and now they've sort of left an imprint of where they, they uh, were hanging out. Because this is a picture, because we've dyed it, it's sort of a I'm not going to phrase that properly, but it's a picture of what once was. So the, the keratin doesn't actually show up on the slides anymore. It's just an imprint of what once was. So we call it cholesterol crystals. Very common in sebaceous cysts, um, in sebaceous cyst aspirates. Common in abdominal effusions as well. Okay, so a lot of broken down cells. Essentially, that's what these are referring to, or these are indicating, is that there was a sample with lots of healthy skin cells, but those skin cells have been there for so long, they start to break down, and uh, it's the dissolution of keratin. This is a sebaceous cyst. If you haven't seen one, oh, the joys. Just get really excited. So it's a cyst that lives in a gland in the skin, and it becomes really big. Clients always get really nervous about them. What is it? Is it a tumor? And then when you express them, you get all this disgusting, wonderful, cottage cheesy type material out of them. Sometimes you don't get cottage cheese. Sometimes you also get a liquid or a plug, and then it goes from there. But they're super fun to express, although you should only express them under the directive of a veterinarian. You shouldn't go around pinching people's animals, although sometimes we do. Okay, so these are cholesterol crystals. Again, uh, really proteinaceous background on this slide. We'll talk about that later in the course, but this is probably an abdominal effusion or a thoracic effusion. But just to note that those, what they are, and that you might come across them in your, in your uh, slides. All right, so now we're going to look briefly at the dermis. So the dermis, uh, we have lots of these little cells called fibroblasts. And fibroblasts, I always think of elastoplast, the band-aids. They're, they're responsible for wound healing. They have collagen fibers. And they, they basically act as a little band-aid. So they're the wound healers that work their way up to the infection and start sealing it off um, with fiber, with structure. So just looking at this, these are all fibroblasts. Okay, now fibroblasts are a spindle cell. So that being said, they have a nucleus in the middle and then wisps on one or either side. And you can see this is quite a clump of them and there's smaller ones all throughout. So those are fibroblasts, not uncommon to see, especially if you take a deep um, epithelial tissue sample to see fibroblasts. Fibroblasts, also you can get fibrosarcoma which is not terribly uncommon, and that's a really bad malignant cancer of the fibroblasts. So it's when they start changing shape and form and multiplying like crazy. In the dermis, you can also see macrophages and mast cells as well. Macrophages we'll talk about in detail. They are white blood cells that started off as monocytes in the peripheral bloodstream, and then as they work their way into tissue, they then become this thing called a macrophage, and macrophages seek to destroy. So they just jolt around the body, they have their little areas that they attend to, and basically they scavenge. So they go through and they eat and destroy foreign invaders, um, other white blood cells, old cells, etc. So they're like little vacuums of the, the tissues. And some areas of the body have very specific macrophages. So I mentioned before we were talking about uh, the skin, the, the epidermis having its own set of macrophages. It's not uncommon throughout the skin, or sorry, throughout the body to have certain designated macrophages for that specific area of the body. We will talk about this in detail, so I'm not going to go too much into macrophages now. Mast cells are an inflammatory response. They are covered in histamine granules. 
and they degranulate, the vessels dilate, they become very permeable. So when you have an abundance of mast cells, typically it's a mast cell tumor, and the skin looks very red, uh, very angry because it's really dilated vessels, okay? Very dilated permeable vessels. So that being said, if we are taking a fine needle biopsy of um, what we suspect might be a mast cell tumor, or if the veterinarian is taking a sample of what they suspect to be a mast cell tumor, we should always, you know, happily remind or be aware of the fact that we should in fact be giving that animal Benadryl ahead of time to reduce the histamine reaction. Because if they have a major histamine reaction, so if they poke, they disturb a mast cell tumor, it can release an extensive amount of histamine into the local bloodstream. It opens up those vessels, everything becomes permeable, and they can essentially have an anaphylactic reaction. Super rare, but it can happen. Likewise, they can just have a moderate allergic reaction too, which we can avoid often by giving Benadryl diphenhydramine ahead of time. These are mast cells. They're super cool, really easy to identify, um, in my opinion, not everybody's opinion, but in my opinion, when they're stained with new methylene blue, and they're just beautiful round cells with a really round nucleus, and they're just typically covered in these tiny little purple granules. Really neat. Okay, there's mast cells, and they do degranulate, right? So they degranulate when they're disturbed. So when we take slides, or when we take a sample and create slides, they often get disturbed and start to release their, their histamine granules. That's what gets released into the bloodstream and can cause an allergic reaction. So this is very suspicious of a mast cell tumor, and in the end it was a mast cell tumor. The skin's really red. They're often very, very round, and one. There's typically just one, which I know sounds silly, but in some cases you see more than one lesion popping up. Cats, it's not uncommon to find mast cell tumors on the head, and with cats, recurrence is higher than it is with dogs. Cats also tend to get mast cell tumors um, in their abdomen, so in their gut, more often than dogs, and it's sort of a silent killer because it causes cats to have uh, vomiting and diarrhea, and we all know everything in life causes cats to have vomiting and diarrhea, so it can often go undiagnosed. Okay, there's another little mast cell tumor, or suspicious of a mast cell tumor, which in, in fact was in fact a mast cell tumor. And then here's two mast cell tumors, which is fairly rare to so have two pop up at the same time. Okay, and then lastly, the hypodermis, so the very base layer, the deepest layer of the, the skin, we have fat. The hypodermis is it consists of fat cells almost entirely, as well as vessels, so little veins uh, or capillaries, arterioles, and lymphatic vessels as well. So these are fat cells. Okay, they're really beautiful to look at. They have a tiny little nucleus, fairly pycnotic. Okay, if we look at this one, these are all fat cells. So they're also called adipocytes, uh, lipocytes. And a fatty tumor, where they have an abundance of fat cells, is called a lipoma. So these are beautiful little fat cells. They're quite big. You can normally see them just on 40 power, even 10 power. They're, they're pretty giant with tiny little pycnotic nuclei. Really common for dogs, certain breeds of dogs especially, to get lipomas, so benign fatty tumors as they age. This guy's got one here, and it's not uncommon for them to get lots of them. So just randomly, clients start to notice that they've got uh, a lump on their chest, a lump on their inner thigh, and it just continues, and they continue to grow. Now that being said, very briefly, I'll touch base on the fact that sometimes these fatty tumors can be malignant, so they can be sort of the, the bad kind of cancer, the bad evil cancer. Pretty rare, pretty darn rare for a lipoma or a, a, a lipocyte tumor to become malignant. If it is, it's called liposarcoma, which is the one that Rob Ford has, if anybody remembers that from the news. Pretty, pretty, pretty rare, but they definitely do exist. If it is a lip liposarcoma, they're very aggressive and uh, spread quickly. Okay, so this is surgery to remove a lipoma, so benign fatty tumor, just going back. There's a lipoma, and here's removing one. 
Oftentimes they're encapsulated, which is really nice. So the surgeon would remove the skin, remove the lipoma, just sort of as a whole. Um, ooh. <laughs> Separate it and then take the actual fatty tumor out. That's it. That's it. That's all.